In September this year, a symposium was held on the subject of Japanology to take a fresh look at Japanese culture from a diverse range of perspectives. Tokyo's Sophia University, a Catholic institution founded in 1913, was the venue for the symposium. It was a welcome event for the new international students who joined the school in September. Currently, Sophia hosts more than 1,000 students from around 60 different countries who make up nearly 10% of the student body. Broadcaster Peter Barakon is one of the symposium guests. Peter has presented a popular show on NHK World about Japanology for over 10 years. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus. I'm Peter Barakan. I'm in a place called Agano, which is in Niigata Prefecture, one of Japan's foremost rice growing areas. Ishizuka san. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Konnichiwa. The program sees him travel across Japan discussing everything from traditional aspects of Japanese culture to the most recent popular everyday items. The show attempts to dispel stereotypes and take a fresh look at Japan with a focus on how people really live their lives. Okay, we're going to look at an aspect of Akihabara now that hasn't changed in decades. We're right underneath the train tracks here, and this building is called the Radio Center, and it's full of tiny little shops that sell plugs and cables, for example. Today, Peter leaves the program's usual format to share his knowledge with students and other panelists. Sophia University's Faculty of Humanities has established a new Japanology course starting next spring. Around 500 students are here at today's event. Miki Sugimura, one of the university's vice presidents, opened proceedings. Professor Sugimura researches international study exchange and multicultural societies. I believe that one of the university's important roles is to create a forum for people from different cultures to discuss and develop ideas about their basic stance, their sense of value and diversity. I hope that you can develop an interest and feel the excitement that comes from diversity and the interaction of cultures. Let's introduce the panelists. Mechthil Dupel is an associate professor at Sofia University, researching the history of Japan-Germany relations. Wenn man nicht weiß, wer man selbst ist, wird man unsicher und das hat äh, oft dann zur Folge, dass nationalistische Tendenzen entstehen. Deshalb finde ich es wichtig, dass sich gerade auch äh, japanische Studenten mit Japanologie beschäftigen. Reinhard Selna specializes in the history and culture of East Asia, particularly Japan and Korea. I'm always very happy to meet other people who, from their perspectives, um, have to say something meaningful about Japan. And Peter Barakon, who we introduced earlier, studied Japanese at the University of London in England before coming to Japan in 1974. It's probably a good time for everybody to take a look at Japan, preferably in an objective way, and try and find out, well, for Japanese people also, to try and find out what their country is and why it is that they think the way they do and help other people around the world to understand that as well. I'd like to move straight into the discussion. I'd like to start by asking each panelist how they first developed a connection with Japan. Perhaps we can begin with Professor Dupel. 
Thank you very much. The first Japanese people I met were some students I became friends with at my halls of residence when I was an undergraduate in Germany. I didn't know anything about Japan, but I wanted to visit. I didn't think it was special. I just wanted to visit the country my friends came from. At the time, most people in Germany had a traditional image of Japan centered around Zen and martial arts. But my Japanese friends talked mostly about Tokyo. So I pictured Japan as being very urban and full of concrete, which meant that when I first came here, I didn't have any culture shock. My first impression was that Japan felt like any Asian country. It was my first experience visiting Asia, and I was delighted, making new discoveries every day. I had two main objectives in coming to Japan. I practiced judo. So at first, I wanted to do more and get better at it. I also wanted to learn more about the society and culture that gave birth to the martial art. This led me to develop an interest in Japanese culture and learn about the links between martial arts and samurai culture, for example. I studied such things by going to Himeji to see one of the castles samurai once lived in. That was my point of entry to Japan and where my study of Japanology began. Himeji Castle led me to consider various things. At the castle was a place for ritual suicide. This is of course part of samurai culture, but suicide is an ongoing social problem in Japan. I naturally started to wonder if the high suicide rate has anything to do with the ritual suicide in Japan's past. When I think about that now, I still don't have a good answer. Even if you come into Japanese culture from a single entry point, it can lead you to broad-ranging discussions of Japan. Well, of the three panelists, I think I'm the one with the least right to be sitting here, as I haven't really done any research into Japan. Actually, my only qualification is living here for 40 years. My connection to Japan began through the Japanese language department of my university. Well, I haven't done any research into Japan, but if you live here for 40 years, you start to see various sides of the country. You start seeing sides of your own country for the first time too, when you're away so long. But the key point is not to have any prejudice. So when I first came to Japan, I'd already studied about Japan. But most of that learning was language study. And, well, I didn't really know anything about the society or how Japanese people think. When I first arrived here, it wasn't that I didn't have any culture shock at all. But because I didn't have any preconceptions, I think I adapted relatively quickly. You see, if you have expectations, then they'll surely be overturned. I think it's easier to adapt to a society if you arrive without them. I think that there are many foreign residents who have quite a detailed knowledge about Japan because, as adults, they studied the Japanese language, came to Japan, and then studied the culture. I think such foreign people are fairly common. I also think that all Japanese people are not necessarily experts about their own culture. 
Most people don't look very critically at the country they were born and raised in. Well, because that environment is so natural to them. It's often outsiders who have more interest and engage in research. That's right. Japanese people who are interested in Germany often know more about various aspects of Germany than I do. I really enjoy meeting and talking to people like that. I think that on both sides we can learn a lot from each other about our own cultures. Actually, I was born and raised in London, and during my childhood, well, I didn't even travel much around my own country. I arrived in Japan right at the start of my adult life. I'm of the generation who liked the Beatles, but to be honest, I haven't been to Liverpool even once. Japanese Beatles fans always visit Liverpool when they go to England, and they frequently tell me about it. I can often actually learn quite a lot from them. Well, I think that in any country, people often tend to hold stereotypes about other countries. And that's usually the fault of the media and TV shows that constantly show the same sides of a country, resulting in everyone swallowing what they're fed. So, when I first came to Japan and told people that I was British, people would always reply with something about British gentlemen. But if you give it a little thought, it's obvious that all the men in Britain can't be gentlemen. And another thing people often mentioned was the fog of London. Well, when I was in primary school, it was often foggy in London. That's because people were still burning coal. In winter, visibility was so bad, you could barely see your hand in front of your face. But then people were told to stop burning coal. So everyone had to start burning smokeless coal instead. After that, well, the smog vanished. But actually, the fog was smoke. I thought London was still foggy. <laughs> Is that so? I guess I'm behind the times. This is one example, but people's perceptions often linger and get a life of their own. Absolutely. The same is true of Japan, which is often called a country combining traditions and modern aspects. Whenever I hear that, I think, what? That's true of every country. Every country combines their traditional and modern elements. Having both of these in a single country is the norm. Even so, this seems to be the international image of Japan. I think in Japan's case, perhaps it's because the country changed so quickly that it appears to be polarized in that kind of way. Particularly after the Second World War, Various aspects of Japanese culture were rejected, and, well, American culture was imported en masse. And it looks to me as if there was a significant change in values. If we just look at Japanese society today, rather than contrasting the past with now, it seems at first that there is a lack of diversity. I was surprised at the homogeneity of people in Japan, not only on my first visit, but every time I return from Europe. People's hair color, height, and clothes all seem very similar. However, if you go to areas of Tokyo like Shinjuku Ward or Minato Ward, you may get a different impression. If you go to the southernmost part, Okinawa, the atmosphere is very different from the main island, Honshu. The differences between Japan's cities and regions are very interesting, as are the differences between areas of Tokyo, like affluent Yamanote and the much more local Shitamachi. For the last 11 years, while well, I've been presenting Japanology on NHK World, 
and every week we deal with various different themes related to Japanese culture. Oh, and we try to provide easy to understand elementary explanations in English. Well, in my position as a host introducing these various aspects, what I really notice is that Japanese people really pay attention to the details, and I think that's a Japanese trait. I still don't know exactly why that is, though. I think there are also great differences in how Germany and other European countries love and view nature in comparison to Japan. Japanese people look at everything very selectively. For example, if there is a small flower, then Japanese people may look only at the flower and say how pretty it is, even if it is surrounded by trash on both sides. As German people cannot enjoy a scene unless it's perfect, they'll be distracted by the trash and unable to enjoy the flower. I think this is one of the key characteristics of Japan. There is a cultural tendency to focus selectively on specific items and not worry too much about what's around them. Just yesterday, I was talking about the Shinkansen, or bullet train, while shooting a TV show. Well, we were saying how 50 years ago this revolutionary technology that existed nowhere else in the world was developed, and that when you look behind the scenes, you can see that its design takes into account really precise details. I think that in many other countries, people wouldn't have gone into such fine details. Well, I think they would take a rougher approach. And another key point you can make is that, for better or worse, there is no individualism in Japan. You see, I think that to a certain extent, this applies to other Asian countries as well. But it's also true that competition and individualism in Japan has become fiercer. When I first came here 40 years ago, well, there was no individualism, and as a result, hardly any competition. I think that if I had stayed working in the UK from the 1970s onwards, well, I might have found it rather difficult as I naturally tried to avoid competing with others. So coming here was just right for me. On the other hand, the great difficulty Japanese people have voicing their own opinion is possibly one of the negatives. People always wonder what those around them think and how people will think of them if they speak a certain way. So people avoid giving direct criticism. I would agree with you that Japanese people do not pursue individualism. But I don't really think we can say people have no individuality. For example, if we look at the early part of the Meiji period, when Japan began to modernize after the end of feudalism, we can see that there are a huge number of really interesting individuals, particularly, but not exclusively in the field of politics. That leads me to think that we can't really say Japan has never had any individuality. Well, I think you're right, but I think that Japan probably became less individualistic with the pursuit of rapid growth during the post-war period. People outside Japan, like us, say exactly what we're thinking, but it's often said Japanese people can understand what's in each other's hearts without words. Put your hands up if you think that this kind of non-verbal communication exists here and is effective. I'm surprised at how few people put their hands up. Perhaps there's a generation difference. So let me ask you another question. How many of you think that Japanese people are a single race? Hmm, not so many again. Maybe younger people think differently. I am just thinking about this now, but I would say that there are many Japanese people who believe that Japan is a mono-ethnic society, 
and Japanese people are different to everyone else. It seems that attitudes in Japan are starting to change as the generations pass. But what do international students think about their new home soon after arriving? Before I came, um, at least the area in America that I was in, everybody thinks of Japan as a very cute culture. Um, cute and quiet and respectful. Okay. And um, also very efficient. I didn't realize how quiet it was going to be. I didn't realize, um, like when I went on the train, I didn't realize that nobody talks to each other. Mm. I, I feel kind of like loud, I feel really loud, like a loud American. During the night, it changed a lot, I think. Um, we can see a lot of drunk people, or people are smoking, so it's easier. Uh, <laughs> it's, okay. it's not that as strict than in the day, during the day. Mm. There, it's like there are two cities in Tokyo, uh. during the day and during the night. It's mm. totally different. Okay. Um, but it's, it's cool, it's okay. <laughs> it's very secure. I've heard that people in Japan are not usually talk what they think, but uh, I I think it will be okay to just not like take take what they talk too seriously. Just uh, interact with them in in what 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 do I like? And uh, uh, I found people are good in good manners and uh, careful about little things and I. Uh, as a po I hope I could be such a person to uh, after studying here for one year. In the second half of the symposium, researchers from Sofia University's Faculty of Humanities joined the panel. Associate Professor Katsutaku Hojo takes part as the moderator. They discussed the Edo period, a time when Japan was in virtual isolation, having cut off almost all contact with the outside world, which lasted from the 17th century to mid-19th century. Kyushu, one of Japan's major four islands in the south, is the region geographically closest to the Korean peninsula and China. Nagasaki is in the westernmost part of the island. Even during Japan's period of isolation, Nagasaki remained open as a foreign port under strict government control. Today, reminders of that era are visible everywhere, as the streets retain a European and Asian continental influence. Before Japan's isolation, trade between Japan and other areas such as China and the Korean Peninsula flourished, and I think that Japan was most definitely an Asian nation. Then, with the isolationist policy, I think Japan transformed from an Asian country into a unique country unlike any other in the world. We often hear that Japan is a unique country with its own original culture, but I think that its culture is actually the result of Japanese people taking the various cultures, philosophies, and technologies that were transmitted to Japan through trade before the closing of the country. Japan changed those elements to meet its own needs and values in a process of hybridization. It was a process of fusion, and I think the result of that fusion was the flowering of culture in the Edo period. We often hear that Japan was a closed country, but over the past 20 or 30 years, researchers have begun to put that phrase in inverted commas and ask whether the country really was closed. Some researchers are starting to believe that Japan wasn't actually closed because there were four open routes into the country. There was steady trade, not only with the Dutch through Nagasaki, but also with the Ryukyu Kingdom through Satsuma, the Ezo via Matsumai, and with the Korean Peninsula through Tsushima. 
What was actually in place was a policy whereby the shogunate controlled international relations and prevented the common people, the public, from contacting other countries as they pleased. The conclusion is that there was that kind of diplomacy, but not a completely closed country. During the Edo period, ko imari was a popular type of porcelain produced in Arita near to Nagasaki. The style was developed by master potters who arrived in Japan from the Korean Peninsula in the 16th century. Most of the patterns used are influenced by Jindai Jin, a major center of porcelain production in China. Koimari porcelain produced in Arita was traded via Nagasaki to Europe. Koimari became very popular among European nobles. Even when Japan was supposedly cut off from the outside world, foreign culture flourished in Nagasaki, a city linking Japan with both Europe and continental Asia. It's clearly true that Japanese culture developed in the context of its relationships with surrounding areas such as China, the Korean Peninsula, and also Southeast Asia. Relationships with China and the Korean Peninsula are major issues for Japan, and I think that cultural exchange with the Asian continent has been extremely important. It's often said that Japan has continually been impacted by foreign countries and that sometimes the influence has come from China, sometimes it has come from the Korean Peninsula, and sometimes it has come from the West. I really think that is the case. I work in our department of Japanese literature, but I actually teach the study of Chinese texts, so it's a form of Sinology. I'm sure many people in our audience have studied classical texts written in Chinese. I think the unique character of Japanese culture and literature is well expressed by the fact that in our lessons, even though we are studying Japan's language and literature, we have to study text originally from China. Both the UK and Japan are small islands on the edge of a continent. In both cases, they're influenced by the continent, but people may think well, to some degree, that the continent has nothing to do with them. The British and the Japanese seem to think they're both special in some way. British people definitely think like that. Because Great Britain had an empire, some people are still under the mistaken impression that, well, Britain is superior to its neighbors. But the British Empire had virtually disappeared by the 1950s. But when immigrants arrived, many ordinary members of the public felt they were superior. So when I see that attitude in the UK, my own country, well, it makes me realize that in Japan, there are also a lot of people who think that we are the only ones who are different. And well, I believe television is a major influence. Japanese TV is always going on about Japan, Japan, Japan. Even when there are segments filmed overseas, there's always a Japanese celebrity playing the role of the reporter who explains what they see. Well, I always wonder if it's possible for them to present interesting information from overseas in a more objective way. Japanese culture developed through exchanges with other Asian nations, but we still want to think Japan is a special country. I would like to ask the panelists how, during my studies, I should try to break away from a view of history centered on one country and overcome my own nationalism to try and take a more objective viewpoint. I would like to hear each of your thoughts on this. I think the key word here is relativism. Instead of looking at a particular cultural phenomenon in an absolutist way, you should compare. When making a comparison, you should not think that something absolutely has to be a certain way, but you should instead consider various options. 
During childhood, well, I think that everybody tends to believe the values of their own country are absolute. I think it's very important for people to move away from their own country and do so not as a group, but as an individual. It's been a very enjoyable symposium, but our time is coming to a close, so I would like to hear some final remarks from our panelists. Perhaps we can ask each panelist how they feel about the future of Japanology and their overall reflections on today's symposium. I think part of the significance of Japanology is to be able to understand your own culture to a certain degree and explain it to people from overseas. I also think that gaining knowledge about your own country helps you to develop a clear identity. That's because learning about your own culture helps you learn about your own roots. I think the role of Japanology is to produce students who can go into society and confidently engage with people from Japan and other countries, whether they are at home or overseas. If you are learning about Japan as a Japanese person, then it is meaningless unless you feel some responsibility towards your country and culture. But the aim is not just to feel accountability, but to actively take part and contribute to society. I sincerely hope you can do that. I've been involved in producing the show Japanology for 11 years, and I've been deeply impressed by the culture created during the Edo period, particularly culture created by craftspeople. However, knowledge of traditional crafts is gradually disappearing, and well, many craftspeople have no one to follow in their footsteps. So what I'm most concerned about is that in 100 years' time, that wonderful culture may have disappeared. Among today's generation, I think that many people don't have this traditional knowledge or a chance to come into contact with it. I'd like to ask you all to take an interest in traditional Japanese crafts and ensure that it carries on into the next generation. That brings us to the end of today's symposium. Thank you for joining us.